and algorithms of some kind are the instantiations of the stored program. That's or they are instantiated by the stored program. That's what this is. And one issue in this also is that hardware typically oper operates at a very low semantic quality. If I were to describe it in a very uh, crude way, this would be your hardware, which if you look at hardware instructions, and I have, if you look at assembly language and uh, similar things, those are very low semantic quality. They ba basically operate at the level of a somewhat well-trained dog, fetch, heal, run. So you have some basic instructions that the hardware can directly understand. And then as human beings, you have human language, which is much more semantically rich. We can use idioms. If I say that guy is a real tiger, I probably don't mean he's an actual wild animal who runs in the forest. I'm using an idiom. I'm using metaphors. I'm using some uh, such constructions. So human language is actually in that way. So there is a gap between what the hardware knows and what a human being wants to say. And this is where programming actually comes in. So in between these, you will have some level, which is the programming language. And this task to convert from a human language description to a programming language is the, done, is the job of a programmer. Nowadays, they would call them developer or whatever, but that's what this is. And this task would be done by a compiler to convert from the programming language to the machine language code. And of course, if the programming language is more and more semantically rich, the job of the programmer becomes easier because it's closer and closer to the human level. Whereas if the language is not that rich and it's close to machine language, it's actually very difficult for the programmer to write the code because the programmer has to cover most of the distance. So that's what this is. So programmers are almost always required because there is no system yet which can, where no, uh, the, the hardware itself can neither understand the human being completely, nor is there a compiler that can cover all this distance automatically. That is why you almost always have human beings in this process somewhere in software development. And unfortunately though, in spite of our best efforts, something can be lost in translation. So what you get here may not be exactly what was described here. And then if the compiler is also not exactly right, then what is, get, what is processed and returned as an output here may not be exactly what was intended. So that does happen. There are famous cases that we all know of where that has happened. <clears throat> and one issue about this also is that users of IT systems are not typically think about, thinking about the underlying algorithms. We all think about services. We all think about things that affect us in our daily lives. And business level outcomes and social outcomes are not the same as the algorithms and the component level workings, which is the world that I came from as a computer scientist. So all the practical issues related to IT are at the level of systems rather than at the level of components and their technologies. That is one of the uh, issues that we need to think about in this workshop also. So briefly to touch on what a system is, I think we all implicitly understand this, but I'll go over the classical meaning of this anyway. A system is a set of components that come together to achieve some overall objective. The system itself can have smaller subsystems inside it, or it may be a part of a larger system, a system of systems. And once again, a simple example of this could be if you have a transportation system, you have different vehicles, buses, cabs, whatever, which are components in that larger system. And then, of course, each one of them can also be looked at as a system on its own. A vehicle like a car will have its own components, right? So a system state is a set of relevant system properties at a given instant of time. And then the system environment is anything that's outside the system which influences the system, where you have some influences, typically information going this way or that. And then all this comes, or it is traced back to the work of Descartes, who was a very well-known mathematician and philosopher. We've all heard of the Cartesian plane and things like that, right? They teach us that even in school. So the principle of analytic reduction is that you have a complex problem that you don't fully understand all at once. Then you describe that or you divide that into various sub-problems and then you work on each one separately. That was the insight of Descartes. And then, of course, this is subject to some assumptions. You cannot do that willy-nilly. This only works if you have division where each part behaves the same way as it does when it's part of that whole system. 
Some of us may have actually studied electronics at some point, right? Or we may have heard or seen electronic devices and so on. And you have, you've also seen that there are transistors and thyristors and God knows what else. And they have certain characteristics. You can actually see how a transistor behaves in an oscilloscope. You can give it certain input voltage, output voltage. You can see how it, the patterns are and so on. And why does that work? Why does that matter? Because the implicit assumption is that a transistor behaves exactly the same way by itself as it does when it is part of a VLSI chip. So a transistor and a transistor circuit actually fulfills this property, where you have analytic reduction and uh, each component behaves exactly the same way by itself as it does when it's part of a whole. And then the principles that govern the coalescing of the system are also well understood. They're not just arbitrarily thrown, thrown together, they are, there is some system, there is some process or there is some uh, structure behind it which I understand reasonably well. That's when this whole thing will work. Now, uh, this is all nice and good. In fact, in service systems, uh, this may not exactly completely work out because Information technology is almost always found as part of a large service system, and no single component of a system, uh, service system is, uh, can actually produce the desired service, but any failure of one component or one large part of the system will actually stop the service. And service is an emergent property of that system. You know what an emergent property is? An emergent property is something that actually bubbles up when the whole system comes together, but it's not a property of any one component of that system, right? And this is the rub, analytic reduction and atomism don't work in service systems. Can you guess why not? Because they cannot be generalized. Okay, why not? Because they, they are different for, the services have to be different for each and every person. And they can't work, like, as you said, they work individually the same way as they work. Right, so the concept here is, yeah, though each component studied singly behaves the same way as it does when it is part of the whole. This is not typically true of a service system. Why is that? Okay, what else? There was a remark that uh, my good friend Bidisha made a little while ago, which I don't know if you observed, that is actually very pertinent to this. Yes? Okay, any service system, any system that produces a service, like a transportation system, is a service system. And the reason I'm emphasizing systems instead of particular technologies or algorithms is that is the way human beings actually think. That's the way society interacts with technology. We don't really think about the GCD algorithm and say the GCD algorithm is something that is doing something for me. We actually use that in a very small context inside a larger system, or at most inside a component. And our Interactions, socio-technical interactions, as Bidisha would say, are at the level of systems, not really at the level of individual pieces of code or whatever, right? So anyway, a service system, this is the short answer, I don't want to spend too much time on this point, is almost always going to include human beings in it. You cannot really have a service system, and I've looked, even with all the AI and all the wonderful advances in many other things that we've actually thought about, there is not really enough AI in the world or likely to be in the world where you can completely eliminate human beings. Human beings are always going to be part of the mix in some way and human beings are famously not going to fulfill these criteria. A human being typically does not behave the same way always when they are by themselves or when they are part of a larger system. That's very well known. There are uh, very well-known studies, there was a very famous example, somewhat gruesome example that I'm not going to go into, where uh, the, it leads to the phrase bystander syndrome. Have you heard of that? Bystander syndrome, what does that mean? Right, so if a good, good-natured person, as I suppose most of us are, sees something happening and we are by ourselves, we are actually quite likely to want to help and we are likely to actually do something helpful. But put the same person in a crowd of 500 people and let the same bad thing happen in front of all of them, no one person actually step forward and do anything. And this actually came up once again, going a little bit more into detail. In the 1970s, there was a very famous incident in the US where a woman was brutally attacked uh, in front of a lot of people and no one did anything. And then that actually gave rise to a lot of psychological studies and so on. Why did all these decent people not help? when they saw something happening. 
So then the, the theory is the bystander syndrome, where any one of them by themselves would have actually tried to do something, but because there were so many of them, they all thought somebody else will do it. If I step outside and do something and I fail in some way, then they'll all think I'm a fool. So in some sense, like the fear of public speaking also. Anyway, so the point is, human beings don't behave the same way in all cases. They're not like transistors. You cannot actually have a characteristic curve for a human being, which is always the same, right? So that's not going to work. And because of that, service systems don't always have these nice characteristics that Descartes gave us. And once again, this is uh, in parallel with what Bidisha was saying earlier today, where a service system requires three types of factors in general. And this is not just service systems. It is true of service systems, but you can also have this for a railroad system or a bridge or a metro that is being constructed in Bangalore or anything like that, right? There are three kinds of factors, technological, economic, and social, and all of you must tick all of these boxes. Without that, the system will not work. And what this means is that the system must be technologically sound. You must already have the technology that you need to build that system and run that system, right? And it must be economically feasible, otherwise it will not work. The money that it needs to generate will not be available. And it must be socially acceptable. Now, if there is going to be a system like a dam, which is going to flood all of Bangalore, then you can expect all of us in Bangalore will actually object to it. And there have been such cases in our country also, right? There have been agitations and people who were disaffected or displaced, they said, no, this is scientifically sound or technologically sound. It's also economically feasible, but it's socially unacceptable. So because society as a whole is not going to accept certain things. So this is also something to keep in mind. And this is sort of a para concern over technology. It's not the same as the technology itself, but you need to think about this also. It's not just thinking about the core technical issues, you need to think about this in a different way. But that said, this is an example of a large computing service. Once again, this actually is at a lower level of abstraction than what really happens, but, and I'm not going to go into what this is and so on. It doesn't really even matter, but the point is there are multiple administrative domains. Each one of these circles is a different administrative domains. Each one of them has a different set of service requirements and uh, technical issues. Somebody who's at that level over there it doesn't really understand what these people are doing. They may not even know each other's names. But then a consumer is actually dependent on the whole thing to work properly to make, some, to make something happen. A complex service system in the computing domain often looks like this. And what somebody like me as a theoretical computer scientist or even an applied computer scientist would do is I would work on one of these boxes. I would say, okay, my work is actually improving this thing over here, which may not actually improve anyone's life. But that's good enough for me because I'm a computer scientist. I don't really think about the social aspects, right? And that is really the problem because there are many people like me who actually have their minds in one very small part of the box somewhere which doesn't really play a very big role in the whole picture. Now, in general, with computing services, you have large systems, complex systems, which often run in degraded mode. What do we mean by degraded mode? Well, think about this one building on this beautiful campus. Do you think all the laptops or desktops or whatever kind of machines here are always running, that they're running right now? I'm pretty sure they're not. There is some machine here that is currently crashed or out of service or something is wrong with it. So if you have a large system, that effect gets amplified. If you have a Boeing 747, you can never actually get it up in the air if you need every light bulb on that blessed thing to be working all the time. There will always be something that is actually degraded. And such failures are commonplace and accepted. And com complex systems are also constantly changing, and nobody really understands how uh, though, uh, they understands its state at any one time. We don't really know what it's uh, doing at any given moment. And sometimes you have catastrophic disruptions sometimes happening because there were certain interactions between failures that I didn't really see, that I didn't really understand or foresee. So the next thing is, to what extent we can actually understand or accept algorithms themselves. So, so far we have talked about systems, but now I'll switch back to algorithms and talk about some of their issues. Although, like I have just finished saying, that doesn't really describe the whole experience that people have in a service system. So <clears throat> algorithmic bias, well, it turns out that there is nothing innate in algorithms that makes them free of bias or incorrect judgment. That's something that we have had to think about. And algorithms as abstractions are quite pure, like the GCD algorithm. There is no culture to the GCD algorithm. 
It doesn't actually care who you are as a person. It doesn't care about your background or your culture. It will not discriminate against you. It's very pure in that sense. But that's not how it is in practice. Algorithms often express and enforce the culture of the people who created them. And that matters also. And last but not least, this is to some extent where I, as a computer scientist, would come in, where we have modeling errors, where we are not really trying to do anything which is biased or cultural. But nonetheless, we have actually found that in some cases, we find that in some cases, your model doesn't really capture uh, reality in the right way. And therefore, the algorithm that you base on that model will not do the right thing. So, Algorithmic bias, well, because nowadays, once again, I, I think I've mentioned a while ago that uh, one of the reasons for AI is that we don't have enough people to make all those judgments, especially at the speed at which we want those judgments to be made. So we have AI systems for things like home loans, medical triage, and parole. Now, home loans, we all understand. Anyone who has actually gone through the process will never forget that. And you need to submit a lot of paperwork and then somehow the loan granting bank or agency will somehow decide what kind of loan you deserve and so on. They have certain criteria based on that. Medical triage applies in large hospitals and so on. So if someone has a broken thumb and someone is having a heart attack, who should get care first? Now probably the guy who's having a heart attack needs more urgent care than the guy who's had, who, who had a thumb broken, right? So that's a triage where there is only one doctor, he can look at either the guy who has a thumb uh, injury or he can look at the guy who's having a heart attack. So in such cases, you need to have triage. If you have to have triage at a larger scale, how do you make that happen? So that also is something where algorithms are coming in. And parole decisions, once again, if a convict is up for parole, as they say in the US, right? So somebody who has been convicted of a crime, they're currently incarcerated, but they are trying to re-enter society, leave incarceration, so that uh, can you actually give them parole or not give them parole? So such decisions also are often algorithmic. And these are the so-called ADM systems, automated decision system, decision making system. And in some ways they are actually quite wrong in a biased way because they often give lower credit scores to women and they often also are seen to con uh, consider black convicts as being more likely to re-offend. So blacks have a lower rate of getting parole using algorithmic systems than whites. And similarly, uh, women are less likely to get a home loan than men. Now, why did that happen? Now, an ADM system, once again, being algorithmic, should not actually have bias, right? Algorithms don't really have bias in, them, in themselves. But nonetheless, even if there is no imperative statement of bias saying, oh, if this person is black, deny their parole request. If this person is a woman, deny her a home loan, no. There will not be any such imperative statement of bias, but nonetheless, some biases are actually inbuilt into the system because they are actually uh, modeled based on the way human beings work. And they're actually repeating the same erroneous processes that human beings have. And in, yes? Also, we cannot eliminate this bias because uh, uh, the data set or, you know, the data we feed to the system uh, on which we, you know, apply AI and basically make predictions or make judgments. So that will be based on the uh, like uh, previous data sets, previous data. So it is bound to you know create biases because we as humans, uh, the data we have created uh, already creates biases. Right, uh, and I will briefly allude to that. Yes, you're making a very interesting point. Yes, you are right that uh, in some cases, the data we use will have biases in it and we don't have a way to get away from that. But nonetheless, we should acknowledge that this problem exists. Uh, unlike, unlike what many people would say, the man on the street op, uh, in, in many cases will believe that an IT system is some census is pure. It's free of error. It's once again, that's scientism at work. The government policies often advocate the use of IT in all contexts without really getting into the right or wrong of it. Um, and we should be mature enough to acknowledge that such a problem exists. Whether we can actually solve the problem short term or not, different question. Yes? I was just adding to that, that, that it's not just the need to acknowledge that the problem exists, but it has a reinforcing effect, right? Like it's, you get locked into reinforcing the same um, societal, like deep and transactional um, prejudices and biases within society, but once it gets reflected in the system. Yeah, I don't know to what, I think that really is taking me well outside my game. I don't know to what extent, that, that once again, I guess those of you who are in the social sciences, you can talk more about that. But to me, 
uh, the first step obviously uh, is to understand and I come from I come at this from the algorithmic perspective I'm not so much at home playing the game uh, that you are, but I certainly think about this like a computer scientist. And to me, the first problem is to acknowledge that there is a problem. Okay, this is not working well. My algorithm is not doing what I want it to do. Let's start from that. How do I make it better? How do I make it better in spite of biases in the data set? Next problem. We can work on that. We can think about that. <coughs> no, and this is important also. The, there are algorithms that are proprietary, like the one that was part of that Houston judgment, where uh, the school district uh, the, was using against the teachers, and the teachers sued. And uh, there is also a different problem here, which I didn't put on the slide, where AI itself is not explainable. Where uh, you don't really understand how a neural network performs its job. We don't really understand how a deep learning system actually gives you the answer that it gives you. And in some cases, we are okay with that, but in many cases, we shouldn't be. And now, in fact, there is a new push at something which is now being called as XAI, which stands for explainable AI. So we don't just want AI where the AI is giving some answer and asking me to blindly trust the answer. I actually want an explanation that I can understand on how the answer was arrived at. And a common, well-known machine learning example for this is that an AI system looked at treatments of people with pneumonia. And it found that people who have asthma seem to recover from pneumonia better than those who don't. Now you would think that's very counterintuitive. Well, how does asthma help cure pneumonia? It doesn't. The fact is that when somebody already has asthma and they contract pneumonia, doctors tend to give them better care. They tend to consider them very high priorities and they prioritize their care and they take very good care of them. Therefore, they have better recovery rates. But the AI will not really understand that. The AI simply finds a correlate and says, someone with asthma recovers better from pneumonia, which is really nonsensical. That's not really a proper conclusion. So if you can actually explain how your uh, machine learning tool uh, is working, machine learning algorithm is working, and so on, you'll be better off. So anyway, that's a different thing. And that also can lead to bias, because if I don't understand how it is working, then how do I know if it is biased? It's just doing something, and I'm accept ex uh, accepting it. So proprietary algorithms and unexplainable algorithms are both problematic in this context. Now, this is a different issue also, where algorithmic culture, where algorithms are also arbiters of culture in some senses. Now, they're not cultural in the sense that human beings are, because we have not yet reached the point where an algorithm can actually read a book and write a review, or where it can watch a movie and then object to it, or give it a rave review, or any such thing. Only human beings can do that even now. But nonetheless, because you have search results and recommendations and so on, they do have significant cultural impact. And uh, a different problem is that nowadays, when was the last time you actually went to a physical library and pulled out a book from the book stacks and read it? Hardly anyone does that anymore. The fact that we have so much knowledge available online is actually problematic to us because it can be filtered without your knowing. Somebody can decide that you don't need to know about a certain opinion. Somebody can decide that you do not need to read an author that they don't like, and thereby f keep you from getting the knowledge that you can otherwise get. Because we don't use offline sources, we can actually be subjected to a lot of inappropriate filtration and censorship. We don't, and uh, that, of course, happens quite explicitly in China and other places, but it can happen everywhere. It's not just China. We need to worry about it everywhere, anywhere that we are. And this is also a problem. There is a, fairly well-known quote, this person is a professor at CMU, where uh, she said that uh, there is a lot of data available, but we are actually not processing it very well, because ultimately you have to understand it in your mind, and that's not really happening very well. We are losing the art of understanding. And <clears throat> culture ought to be democratic in some sense, right? Your culture and my culture, we all have a vote, and I get to express my culture, you get to express yours. But that's not really the way it is, because algorithmic culture Algorithmic recommendations and so on, they're driven once again by corporate greed. They're not really uh, uh, democratic in any sense. And big data, well, big data, what is the biggest problem with big data? Big data is corporate data. Corporate entities hold all our data. They take your picture probably 20 times a day, and you don't get to see those pictures. They can actually see those pictures, and they can infer certain things about you that you don't even think about. For example, nowadays, algorithms have gotten to the point where they can infer a person's 
sexual orientation. They can infer your moods. They can infer certain other things about you from very small nuances in your expressions, right? So, and all that data is available, not to you, but to somebody else. So that actually is a problem with big data. Digital hoarding, same thing, where they have data about you, about other people, where they don't share it with anyone. They don't share it with me if I'm an academic and I want to do something. But uh, they will use it for their corporate purposes. That's a problem also. And minority cultures, of course, have always had difficulties. If you speak a minority language in any society, uh, the state of Karnataka uh, has a major language, which is Kannada, but we also have several other languages, some of which are gradually tending to lose their edge, right? And that happens everywhere in the world. English is the major language globally. Hindi is the major language nationally. Kannada is the major language in the state of Karnataka. But then you always have minority cultures and languages in all of these contexts, and they often get suppressed. Uh, but IT, and in a very explicit way by IT systems. And that is a problem. And there is a phrase called the digital divide. There's a term called the digital divide, which I guess was a little more common um, back, I would say, around the year 2000. There was a very well-known book written around that time. And this also happens in algorithmic culture where there is a set of people, also in our country, right? We are all blessed and fortunate that we have access to all these wonderful IT resources. A lot of people close to us, geographically close to us, don't have such access. So their culture doesn't really get expressed as much online as ours. So that's the digital divide. So the cultures of the haves and the have-nots get treated very differently. Those who don't have access to uh, IT resources, their culture gets ignored in many cases. So that's how algorithmic culture exists. And this, once again, is probably the closest where I personally would get. The model is an abstraction with some mathematical or computational basis, like agent-based models and statistical models, where you try to capture some aspect of a real system. And that's because the real system is horrendously complex. There is no way you can actually capture the entirety of a real system. You actually have a model that captures some essential aspects of a real system. And then you make models, and then you work algorithms inside those models. You have algorithms that run on those models and describe how the system would behave. That's, some, that's the kind of thing that I would actually do. And there's a very well-known quote by a man called George P. Box. He's actually deceased now. Uh, he was a very well-known American statistician. He said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. What he meant by that is all models are wrong because no model actually captures the entire system in its full glory. But some are useful because they give, you, they give you some insight into how some aspects of the system will be. And the problem for us is that in some cases, modeling errors are liable to become apparent. So you have algorithms and you have models. Even if there is nothing wrong with the algorithm itself, the modeling error will mean that in some case, in some, at some instance, you will actually get some problematic conclusion because the model doesn't match the reality. Okay. So, Ethics also is a big issue with algorithms, and sometimes they can be unethical. That's because they can be used to influence public opinion. They can promote political causes. They can conduct marketing in quite inappropriate ways. Uh, you can actually be biased toward or against certain opinions because you're only exposed to certain viewpoints about certain things. And machine learning and big data, especially with the kind of data that uh, big companies have about you, can be used to do certain things in very good ways, where they actually build recommendation engines which expose you in a very fine-grained way. They actually know, know us much better than we realize. And this is also a problem that we have seen. And in fact, this has actually been a point of some discussion in the media, if you've been following this. A lot of bots that you see on Twitter and so on, a lot of people, supposed people that you see on Twitter and Facebook aren't really people at all. They're actually software agents. They're software bots. And on Twitter, I was actually quite su surprised to learn about a couple of years ago that you can actually buy followers. Did you know that? <laughs> there, there are actually companies whose business model, I guess, is somewhat questionable, where they will actually sell you 1,000 followers for $100 or some such thing. It's actually quite cheap. You can get uh, so many followers quite cheaply. I unfortunately have not had the money, so I haven't done that. <laughs> so, and similarly, you can buy likes on Facebook. You can buy likes or retweets on Twitter and so on. So that actually distorts the social media platform. Because if the platform is pure and it's actually real people retweeting and sharing their opinions, we can respect that. Even if the opinions are some things that we disagree with, they're OK. But now what is happening is, if a new movie is to be launched, or if a new product, like an automobile or 
any new phone or some such thing is being launched, then the company that is doing that will actually buy a lot of publicity on Twitter in this way. They will actually have a lot of bots retweeting this. They will have a lot of uh, publicity that is actually fake, not really people who are actually doing this out of their own free will. And that actually distorts social media quite a bit. And unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that the social media companies are quite happy, apparently, to go along with this charade. Not good. And such influences are mostly unseen. They are at least unseen by common people. You and I can understand it if we actually put our mind to it, but most people who use Facebook, who use Twitter, who don't uh, really put much thought to it, they don't really understand what is happening here. And uh, that also goes back to the fact that in most cases, such things are assumed to be benign or beneficial, but they are not. So, just clarification. So, previous slide on models. Mm -hmm. Any model is based on algorithms and algorithms. Is that the relationship? An algorithm is not based, or a model is not based on an algorithm. But the, the point is, okay, if I want there to be an algorithm, once again, I think a gentleman there asked, uh, for an example of an algorithm a while ago, right? So if you want to have an algorithmic perspective where you can actually build a tool that predicts an outcome, like for a recommendation engine, or if you want to predict the spread of a disease, or if you want to predict how a system will behave in reality when exposed to a certain kind of input, for that, you need a model. And given the model and its properties, you can then write the code or come up with the algorithm that then predicts how that model is likely to behave under that input. And that tells you something about how the system in turn would behave under those conditions. That's the way it actually works. Parameters of the model determine, determine which algorithm you're going to pick? Not quite. The parameters of the model, well, to some extent, yes. In some cases, you, you might be right. But um, the parameters of the model or the general structure of the model will will have a lot to say in terms of how um, how good the algorithm turns out to be in in its predictive power in its expressive ability in terms of uh, telling you how well that system uh, exactly what the system in the real system will do ultimately all this is meaningful if and only if uh, it helps you understand how the, how the reality is if it uh, if it tells you something about the real system for example if i want to understand how uh, a cyclone hitting Chennai will do something, right? So I obviously cannot arrange it, and even if I could, I wouldn't. It's uh, not possible, first of all, and second is I don't want to do anything like it ever, but uh, if I want to build a model, then I will actually think about, okay, what is a suitable model for this? And then I will run some algorithm on it, and then figure out, okay, this shows that these are the conclusions, and therefore there are certain things which I uh, can infer based on this. So. If the model itself is wrong, then regardless of what the algorithm is that you choose to run on it, the conclusion will be questionable. That's the point. So modeling errors are an independent uh, point of uh, question over and above what the algorithm is also doing. If the algorithm is wrong, yes, then you have a separate issue. But regardless of what the algorithm is, if the model itself is not capturing the system properly, is not capturing the reality in the right way, then you will not end up with the right answer. That's the point.